You're watching this video, so the chances are great that you enjoy what we create here at The Odd Drain. And if you do, why not take the next step and subscribe to this channel? You might also consider a membership in the Audrain Automobile Museum. We mount four new exhibitions each year featuring cars from the Audrain collections and loans from some of the leading collectors and institutions around the world. Click here to find out more. care about fitted luggage or certain types of leather in the interior or any of that type of thing. I mean, that, that doesn't really matter to me. I, I just like to improve the, the driving quality and feel of the car. Um, I mean, it adds some much needed horsepower. I mean, if, if these cars fail to measure up, the originals fail to measure up to modern cars in any way, it's not the handling, it's just they don't have as much power, you know. Or, yeah, this or, certainly... Uh, it certainly does have the horsepower. One of the things that I also admired, now of course the, the name Singer, since Rob Dickinson's name is not Singer, right. uh, is his uh, homage to Norbert Singer, right. the great uh, Porsche engineer who engineered all the great Porsche race cars in the 1970s exactly. and 80s. And uh, what I love, and you mentioned the fitted luggage and all that stuff, you know me, I'm a, a fool for quilted leather right, and exactly. all that. And uh, so this is a festival of of basket weave leather. I right. mean, and there is quilted leather in the engine compartment of a singer. Cool. So you get you get this whole idea of sort of custom bespoke but with actual performance. You know, I to me it's the difference between a what's the watch? Batik for how do you uh, say Batik Philippe. Batik Philippe and a Apple Watch. You know? 
I enjoy watches. Mecha- I like the mechanicalness of it. I love uh, my mechanical watch. Before I go to bed, I love turning that wheel and hearing the mm. click, 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 and, and you know. Like on my uh, Omega Speedmaster. Exactly, exactly. But this is better in every respect. <laughs> And it's the same thing with this. This is a Petit Philippe car in the sense that it's a mechanical thing. It's totally analog. It is all. It is air cooled. But it's the best that that can be. That that is great. I've never thought about this car in that way. And you're absolutely right. And it's funny because even even Dickinson talks about the idea of taking the delicacy of the design of the car in the 60s, the sportiness of the racing cars of the 1970s, and the practicality and robustness of the 1980s with the power of the 1990s. Right. So he sort of puts puts it all together. Well, it's actually the power of the... 2000s. New millennium, really. Yeah, Yeah, that's a funny thing. The more time I spend in this car, the more I admire the work that they've done. I've, I've appraised a couple of these, and that was a very interesting exercise as well, because... When you appraise a vintage car, normally you look at market comparables of other cars of the age, the type, etc. This is appraised under the um, appraisal value scheme of replacement value cost. Right. Because it's, a new, it's basically a new vehicle. Right. And so you say, okay, in order to replace this in case of an accident or a loss, what would it cost to build this again? Right. And the Singer cars, the Singer, the Porsche 911, reimagined by Singer, I have to be very careful about using the full name, um, they have a very long waiting list because it takes a very long time to build the cars, and it takes a certain patient kind of an owner. I also love the aesthetic of this car. Yeah. It's painted Downton Blue and right. Singer Racer Orange, which right. brings you that whole idea of the whole golf racing period as right. well, but in a very, very refined uh, package. It's really quite something. Plus, the owner has input into what his car will be, which is kind of fun. It's almost impossible to get. I mean, I'm sure Ferrari and a few others will build you a bespoke automobile. But, but not, not to this more, level, where yeah, you choose right. the actual performance in addition to all the aesthetics. Right, right. Um, and certainly in the early builds that they, that they did, uh, they started building cars, and they introduced these cars in 2009. And... This car was built in 2016, and in talking to Rob about it, for a very long time, they really were very interested as well in the balance of the car, not building super horsepower cars, but cars that were all round performers. Right. Now, they've since built some cars for customers that they request that have a lot of horsepower, but that's not really what the Singer thing is about. But there's a wonderful snickety-snick to the shifter, you know? It just clicks right in. I mean, everything feels... Jay, this Porsche 911 reimagined by Singer. Right. Um, you know, obviously, as you saw and experienced, it's a great car on the road. And we also talked about the fact that I love fancy leather. Right, right. And this takes the entire idea of 
the bespoke nature of a high performance car to me to the ultimate Donald Osborne level because let's check out the engine compartment. All right. I know these, this engine was built by uh, your pal uh, Ed Pink, and there's quilted leather oh, that's in the right. engine compartment. Yeah. Everything is torqued to right specification. Nothing weeps. It, it's it's really nice. That's why otherwise that leather would be just be soaked with grease and exactly. it would look ridiculous. But uh, no, I mean you open this hood, you think this engine never been started, and that's kind of what you're paying for too. And speaking of the handwork, I mean, the, the details on this car are, are, are amazing. And it's so well suited to this house. And Snug Harbor is a house that really shows amazing details. Let's take a look at the house. Yeah. So who built this house originally? This house was built by Potter and Robinson, same architects as uh, Hammersmith Farm, for Admiral Charles H. Baldwin, built in 1877. And as we were discussing with the singer, what makes this house really interesting is the fact that it's a transitional house. It's showing the, the transition from the Queen Anne Revival shingle style to the later uh, brick and stone fashion that you'd see here in Newport in the later houses. And it's really fascinating, this house. It is full of amazing details. And it's something that would have been very much at home for Admiral Baldwin. Uh, he was a great naval commander in the Civil War. And right. a lot of people don't think about the Civil War as a naval uh, engagement. They think all about well, the land the battles. Well, the and the Monitor, certainly that was... Exactly, but yeah. even that was in Hampton Roads. Right. So it's still really near the shore. But uh, Admiral Baldwin was most famously known for, first of all, leading the bombardment of New Orleans, but for chasing the CSS uh, Alabama, which was the Confederate Navy's uh, most uh, successful privateer that really broke the Union blockade. Right. And he commanded a ship, the USS Vanderbilt, which oh. was an interesting a sort of Newport connection, right. in that the USS Vanderbilt was one of the leading ocean liners on Cornelius Vanderbilt's transatlantic service. Right, right. And it was uh, purchased by the Navy, and uh, Admiral Baldwin chased the Alabama all across the world to, to the West Indies, into the Pacific, into uh, North Africa. It was absolutely amazing. Really? Yeah, yeah, it was a fascinating thing. And so he never did catch it, by the way, but nonetheless, uh, there's another great, wonderful, slightly tenuous connection between Baldwin, Vanderbilt, Newport, in that Baldwin's granddaughter became the second wife of the Duke of Marlborough, whose first wife was Consuelo Vanderbilt, Cornelius Vanderbilt's daughter, okay, who, you helped, like, save, you like, who yeah. helped save the, the, the Duke of Marlborough in Blenheim Palace with her fortune. I'm still off the coast of North Africa. <laughs> but, you know, this is what I call a classic back east kind of house. Yes. Living in California, you don't see the. You get a little bit of, we have that style called the Craftsman, which I think is unique to California. I'm not really sure. Is that true? Is well, it? Well, it's largely seen in California, but there are Craftsman houses all over. There right, are a lot of Craftsman right. houses but in the Midwest is, and East. Would this qualify as a Craftsman type house? No, it's Queen Anne because right. it doesn't have the basic elements of a Craftsman. Craftsmen are very sort of four square houses. Right. Um, lots of wood carving, but very solid. Right. The Queen Anne combines a number of styles, the Tudor style, so you see that um, the cross banding of wood over brick or stucco. Um, and then you also see here the shingle style that you normally see on beach cottages, but this is certainly no beach cottage. But lots of angles, lots of lots of uh, symmetry in the massing. So you see little gables in places right. and strange little windows at odd angles, and that are still appealing. You know, when you look at anything from the 1900s, transportation-wise, you wouldn't ride in it today. It wouldn't be practical or comfortable for any reason. Yet we live in exactly the same type of house. I mean, people who live in this house, with the exception of the television and the internet and everything else, live exactly as he did in 1877. You've got a big fireplace in every room. Of course, now you've got central heating, but there's still a romance to lighting those fireplaces. Imagine coming home on a cold winter's day and having all those fireplaces going. 
Must have been really welcoming back in the day. And in the summer, sitting out on, underneath the shade on this broad porch. Right, right. It's, it's definitely the style of life that, again, this house named Snug Harbor. Right. The safe home to which a sailor comes at the end of the day. Right. And so in this as well, obviously in transition, we see our next car, the Jeep Wagoneer. Because the Jeep Wagoneer really invented the modern luxury SUV, and that was back in 1963. And like the house with the attendance connection, it also has wood on the side. Exactly. Exactly. You see? Craftsmanship. Let's see what it's like on the road. invented this particular segment of the market and then they just lost it didn't they yeah they did they've actually just come out with a new grand wagoneer it'll be very interesting to see how it does in the marketplace but this is really a market defining car we take for granted today the idea of a big comfortable luxury sport utility vehicle right but you know back when this car was first introduced in 1963 but it was fantastic. I mean, you think about this this, this vehicle, you know, all-wheel drive, big V8 engine, and they made some in, in six-cylinder as well, but the V8s outsold the six-cylinders, you know, practically two to one. Right. And uh, they were also the first of the four-wheel drive vehicles where you could shift into low gear without having to stop the car and get out and lock the hubs and all right, that. Right, right. So some it made it practical. Drive, you exactly, yeah, yeah. some of the four-wheel drive, rather. Well, it's interesting, because when these cars came out, like back in the 60s, the way you sold cars, it was the low price feel, the medium price feel, and the high, I mean, they used to say that in the end, DeSoto, right. we're the leader in the low price feel, you know? People and, were proud to buy something in the low price feel. Well, well yeah, do that just today. Not, you know, so the <laughs> idea of having a luxury car in the low price, feel, well, it didn't make any sense, you know? When you got a stripper, you got no heater, you got no radio, right. you got no cigarette lighter. You know, and I also loved all the blank things on the dashboard to tell right, you what you right. didn't buy. Right. <laughs> but when this came out, the idea of having a luxury vehicle that you could use in the snow, uh, I mean, it just seemed, it, it was unbelievable. And somehow they lost that market to everybody else. The other thing that changed it was, there was a law in the 90s that, uh, any vehicle more than thirty something thousand dollars was subject to a five five percent luxury, luxury tax, tax unless yes. it was a truck. Right. So people realize, oh, for the five percent, I could get a luxury truck and not pay the tax. So I'd have the luxury features of a luxury car, but the utilitarianism of a truck. You know. So there's always some social or tax reason why almost everything happens, you know. <laughs> why the English tax by the bore and not by the stroke and all that kind of thing, you know. It's, yeah. uh, it, is, it is astonishing. And, you know, when you think about how this was built, um, well, actually, one of the other fascinating stories about the Wagoneer is the fact that I can't think of, of any other models that was actually built under three different manufacturers. Jeep saved so many companies in history. Right. Um, this car was designed under the Kaiser, Kaiser Jeep, right. back in the late 50s, introduced in 1963 and manufactured and sold by them. And then when AMC took over Jeep in 1970, they continued production. And then they continued production through the time that Chrysler bought Jeep. And uh, so it was quite an amazing run. And I think I'm not sure of the statistic. I think it's either the third or fourth longest running uh, model in American history. Yeah, I think that's true because Chrysler bought Jeep, not American Motors. They bought Correct. American Motors to get Jeep. But exactly. Jeep, if you remember the Alliance and all those crazy things. Oh, uh, the Alliance, one of my favorite cars, yes. Yeah, they threw all those away. But, but this has that rare thing of all the luxury features with the crappy build quality that was sort of prevalent in the 60s. I mean, everything kind of kind of works, but 
just feels a bit. It has a slightly cheesy feel. Right, right. Uh, it, it, yeah. It's pseudo luxury. Um, right, right. Yeah, it, yeah. It's 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 like you know when they say luxury apartment because you have two windows in the room. You know? Right, right. Um, and a balcony that looks out onto another balcony, but and and the plastic wood. There's nothing like feels nothing says right. luxury Even like plastic when you wood. Put the, the window up there's a hum that goes you know there's a, you know that. that's what Mercedes did so well with the 600 they made it all hydraulic so everything moved effortlessly when you just hear just a just a, the briefest it's a, like air rushing past maybe. exactly so, yeah something something that you have an invisible genie in the door controlling everything um, but that being said this does ride very nicely I mean it's a 6 liter VA well it's 5.9 yeah it's a good size V8. It's got plenty of power. Suspension is yeah. wonderful. Yeah. It actually handles, well, you can't say handles, but it responds well. You know, you turn the steering wheel, you'd expect that, you know, you're the captain on the bridge of an ocean liner calling down to the uh, to the engine room to uh, move right. the rudder. But it actually responds fairly well. This is a fairly low mileage uh, example of the car. It's got uh, just about 39,000 miles from new on it. And it really feels quite solid. Yeah, it does. It does feel very nice. But you know, if you're a rancher in Wyoming and you're kind of an outdoor guy and you're wealthy, this is as good as it got. This is better than a Cadillac because you can take it camping, you can take it into the hills, yet it had the electric seats and the big heater and the air conditioning and all the things that were that were uh, desired back in the day that you couldn't get in a regular truck. Yeah, and it's, uh, you know, again, today we think it not unusual at all that people have these luxury pickup trucks. There are people that have pickup trucks that never carry anything in the bed right. and they're outfitted like uh, luxury sedans, like Cadillacs. Well, the one I can think of was the first in its field was the Lincoln Blackwood, you remember that? Yes. And that was to me the silliest thing <laughs> because it had this kind of teak. Yes, um, like, like, a, like a motorboat. Yeah, rear, the cover over the bed, you know. So you had a really, really, really big and long and flat trunk with a really big lid right yeah it was really odd and of course it was a full Lincoln interior but it was a truck and it was not successful because it was it, before its time I think it was well before its time and it was a little too much luxury in a truck I need a truck truck you know well I think maybe Jay it was also before people could admit that they were actually not buying something for utility right right you had to actually come out and make the statement Hey, I'm doing this for style. Right, right. <laughs> well, that's true. But the other thing is that um, you know you think about vehicles that cross socioeconomic lines. Well, not socioeconomic lines, but social social lines. Right. And the Wagoneer is one of those cars because it was as popular with the sort of East Coast Country Club set as with the Montana Rancher set. Right, right. I mean, the cars that would be the Mini would be the same. Thing. Exactly. Twiggy had one, and members of the royal family had one, and Prince Charles had one. You know, the other car that did it too was the Mustang. So yes. Mustang was for everybody. You know, they'd show the frumpy accountant and then he'd undo his tie and open his shirt and he's driving a Mustang. You know, all that kind of stuff. It's very funny. So it's, it's an interesting thing. And uh, again, like the, uh, the house that uh, we're visiting today, Snug Harbor, it's that transition from workhorse to comfortable go everywhere vehicle. Right. You know? This is, uh, again, one of those things that you harbor? could... It's not in a harbor, and it's not really snug. It's a pretty good-sized house. Well, you? again, it was built for an admiral. Right. It was oh. his snug harbor. He's come home to his warm harbor. Oh, I see. All right. So, uh, his works. refuge. And, actually, this is a great refuge as well. I mean, uh, we've spoken often about my uh, cross-country uh, drive criteria. This is certainly... A vehicle that you could drive across the country you'd carry all of your gear in it and just sort of waft along when you wanted to get off and visit a national park you've got a little bit of uh, right. off-road capability if you wanted to although uh, much like the uh, one of my favorite segments in the uh, Disney Pixar cars movie the first one is when the drill sergeant SUV has got all the fancy SUVs with 22 inch wheels and he's taking them off-road and they don't want to get their wheels dirty and it's quite funny oh, that's <laughs> You know what's interesting to me about this whole series? Uh, you, you know the houses. I don't know. I always assumed that people in the 1800s, early 1900s, maybe because my parents are immigrants, lived 
horribly tough life. Everybody lived uncomfortably. Yes. You know, all rooms are always cold in the winter and hot in the summer. And, and you come here and you see these houses and you realize people live in these houses now with the exception of television and radio and the internet exactly the way they did in the 1800s and 1900s. You know, the rooms are big and airy and comfortable and there's a lot of greenery and that's what I noticed since I, I, I lived here. Because when I'm in my house, I live the way that people lived in the house when it was built in 1936. You know, I rarely have the TV on or music right. on. I'm usually reading a book or I'm sitting by the ocean or something. I go, oh, this, you know, I never thought I would do that. But it, it, it just makes me realize, you know, people lived pretty good back then, especially around here. Well, you know? it's, it's, it's thinking about what Newport represents. I mean, obviously, the working uh, seaport. And, and the sailing and commerce, but Newport was also a place where people went to relax. Right. Granted, whether it was for four or six weeks in the season, but the houses are designed to sort of lower the blood pressure and, and the heart rate. And uh, that's, the, that's the ideal situation. Obviously, in order to do that, there were a lot of uh, people working in service to make sure that life right. for the people who owned the houses was as easy as possible. But it's also an interesting thing that we see in the houses that we've covered in this uh, series so far, and will in the future, to see how the concept of sort of leisure changed. Um, we're thinking that you know we're, we're near the ocean, uh, near the beaches, but some of the houses like Snug Harbor are built more like houses you would find in towns and places. Right. And something that uh, has a a very solid feel. It doesn't feel sort of temporary beach cottagey. Right, right. Um, which I think is also a very different thing about Newport. There's a certain permanence uh, about the place and about the houses here that uh, is, uh, is quite wonderful. Actually, this car is kind of a combination of the first two plus the house. It's as big as a house. It's got Porsche pretensions and it's a sporty handling car. And practical. And practical. Like the Jeep. Right, right. I mean, you can, you can take it anywhere. It's like the Jeep, it's all wheel drive. Mm -hmm. So in the snow, I mean, I find these to be fascinating. I, this is If you can only have one car and you wanted something sporty and you could afford it, this is the way to go. Yeah, this is what W.O. Bentley would be proud of today. I think a lot of the cars in the 70s were just Rolls Royces without the flying lady on them, whereas this has the sporting pretensions that, that uh, he would have liked. And of course, also something that uh, means a lot to me, uh, the fact that it's not the biggest engined Bentley, Right. But it's the V8 and not the, the V12. And um, it is something that, that also shows the fact that cars today are all about not just pure horsepower numbers, but about the balance of performance. Right. And it has a lot of unique Bentley features. This was always a Bentley feature, the metal screw-on cap to give that feeling when you check the oil of you know, snickering it down, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, nowadays everything is sort of plastic and you pull it out. I'm surprised at how far forward the engine is. It's, yes. If, if this was a Porsche, I would feel like I was opening the rear hatch because the, the engine actually hangs over the front axle, which seems to defy engineering, you know. But For a performance it car, you want everything masked in the center of the car. So right. let's uh, take a drive and see if that let's front engine shot. placement uh, Makes a difference or not. And it shuts. Like a like a, a bank ball. So driving this Bentley down Bellevue Avenue seems very appropriate. You know, it's got enough of that traditional Bentley luxury feel that you feel at home on Bellevue Avenue, and yet. Well, this is probably the truest 
the W.O. Bentley's ethos of any Bentley in recent. I have a Turbo R from 1989, actually the very first one in America. I'm anxious to get it. And it's basically a four-door sedan with a turbo. Right. I mean, the suspension's a little different. And a lot. At the time, uh, it shows how quickly we moved, it was the fastest four-door sedan you could buy. <laughs> and it, it was relatively, I still have it and I, I drive it a lot, it's very nice. But this actually meets what W.O. Bentley wanted to make, a sporting car with luxury. And it's probably the most geared to its client than any other car I can think of. Absolutely, and as you said, it also is not a brand sort of making up an image. It's actually right. returning to what made the brand itself. But so many guys think they want a Porsche or think they want you know, with the you know, buttock numbing Recaro right. seats and all the other <laughs> stuff. And then they get one and the wife doesn't like it or it's, it's not covered. This has just enough luxury and just enough sporting. Let's face it, nobody drives a car at 10 tenths on the street. Right. And this is a car at 5 tenths or even 7 tenths on the street. It, it, it provides excitement, it's fast. I mean, acceleration is amazing. Um, it's actually, I actually prefer this over the 12 cylinder model because yes. it's a little lighter, it handles better. I would prefer rear wheel drive only, but I understand why they have four wheel drive. Yeah, and I this, mean, you want, you want yeah. the, the ultimate, especially for the street yeah. version, you want the ultimate in control for a driver with this kind of power. As and well. this has been one of the most successful, successful cars, I, I think, in Bentley history because it's probably fifty to seventy thousand dollars less than the competing models mm -hmm. and the interiors and the clock and the way uh, you know the analog feel to it even though it's not analog right uh it, it, it really harkens back to the era yet very modern like this is all carbon fiber and uh, rather than traditional wood but you can get the wood if you want i mean bentley interiors to me are among the best in the industry if you're looking for that classic sort of bentley look and you know, once you get over 200 grand on a car, now you're in the stratosphere. And these, I think, at least when they were new, not this particular model, because this is the top, top of the line. I think when the Bentley came out, they were 160, something like that, which is a tremendous amount of money, of course, but not as much as an Aston Martin. Exactly. Or, it, or it delivered any, a, a level yeah. of, uh, of performance. And uh, going back to the interior for a sec, I think they did a really masterful job of blending the luxury and the sport. I mean, you know, to save weight, the door panels are simplified. They're mostly carbon fiber, right. but you still have the exposed stitch leather right. edges and, and, and the Alcantara on the seats and things like that. Um, which is also, frankly, practical because it holds you in place if you're driving in a spirited manner. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's the one thing that I, I do have to say that I find curious about this car, which I really love. And oh, they made 99 of these for the US market. So it's a very limited uh, model. Oh, is that GT3 right? I didn't realize it was yes, that limited. Only 99. Okay. And, um, but it is obviously a sporting car. Right. But I always had a problem with the stripes. I thought, you know, it's, it's a sporting car, but it's still a Bentley. But, you know, people are divided about it. Some people absolutely love them. Other people just find them slightly strange. Well, with only 99 of them, it, it's more uh, like, oh, look at that, as opposed to, oh, God, there's another one of those with this. You know, ah, you, yeah, you, true, true you, that. You, you know, <laughs> I mean, plus this one is white, so the stripes bring out a little excitement to it, I suppose. I mean, it's, it's not quite my uh, cup of tea in terms of what I would want either, but it just does a nice job. You know, it's so funny when you look at companies like Tesla and they get away from actual leather and exposed stitching mm. and analog type gauges and you know and go for a totally minimalist look whereas this i think your average bentley owner is some sort of captain of industries type or somebody reasonably successful they like having all this information whether they actually use it or understand it right but it's it, there it, it, it's there and it, it gives a sense of importance to the car what is oh boy let me see what my uh, oil temperature is, you know, whatever it might be. <laughs> well, you know, we're used to uh, having to monitor all those functions in the older cars that we like to drive. Um, but here, yeah, it's sort of an optional feature. But another thing I think this car does really well, um, and frankly, for me, harkens back, I'm sure, as you as a 
uh, W.O. Bentley owner, multiple, multiple uh, uh, Cricklewood Bentleys, is the ride. Right. The ride is very firm. Right. And you can tell that obviously it's geared more to handling, but it's also very comfortable. Yeah. It doesn't, yeah. you know, punch you in the back and, and all of that. But it gives you a sense of security, I think, you know, knowing the right. car's going to do what The guy what that buys this is usually between 45 and 60. Mm -hmm. And consequently, they're in their peak earning years. And this car, that's why they sold so many of them. They know the market perfectly. You're successful. I wanted something where, you know, if the wife wants to go up to Vermont and look at the foliage, they're not going to be wrapped up in a blanket and screaming at me the whole time. You know, they're going to be, you know, be comfortable and, you, you know, yeah. The visibility and you can have the conversation good. in the car. Right, right. <laughs> no, these are, these are just wonderful cars. And it's uh, terrific, too, because I think that the whole GT3 uh, series and class has brought out some wonderful cars from, from lots of manufacturers. Right. And uh, sort of brought us a little closer to the, to the 1960s days of the... DT cars that you drove in the street and competed on the track. Right, right. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I always thought it was fantastic. And when I was really getting into cars, that was what drew me to so many cars. And, you know, this obviously relates to the GT3 R racing car. You know, it doesn't have a back seat and the right. semi minimalist uh, uh, interior features. But it's so strange also to realize, of course, as you said, the GT3 R race car is rear wheel drive only, as right. it would be. And it actually weighs 2,000 pounds less than the car we're in yeah, right now. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. <laughs> that's pretty amazing. But you know, the other good thing is you could pick these up, not for a song, but you know, there are so many of these Bentleys that were sold. When it came out, it was a huge sensation. And so many are coming off lease now that you can get them at a pretty reasonable price. The, the, certainly the, the, the Bentley GTs and some of the Super Sports the GT3 R's are at a premium. Right. This is a very rare car, incredible performance, 592 horsepower. Right, right. It's, it's just uh, absolutely astonishing. Uh, yeah, it's just wonderful. It's really sort of what, if they continue to make the Chrysler lighter cars. Yes, exactly. It, it would have been, you know, this would be an American, a British version of a Chrysler lighter car in the sense that you have extremely powerful engine, and it's a full-size automobile, you know. Uh, banker's hot rod was a term they always used for the Chrysler. And this would be that too. This would be a banker's hot rod. You could be, uh, you know, you could take the kids, well, you couldn't take the kids to school on no. this one. There's no back seat. But, They'd be sliding around. Right, the regular <laughs> Bentley, it's perfect. And then you go off zipper on the highways and have some fun on them. Yeah. So I think it's, it's a great example of uh, how we saw in Snug Harbor the transition between the uh, cottage style houses and the timber houses to the big stone houses that would become the typical Newport cottage. Right. And here we see a transition, but a transition in another way because Bentley going back to its roots. Mm -hmm.